Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, this is Mac, and sitting next to me is Myra. This is Adoration Sunday Service. Beautiful day, unlike last week. So let me do some quick explaining, because last week um, we had some turbulent storms hit our area right at the time that we were broadcasting. It uh, particularly affected uh, what I was sharing last week. So uh, what I'm going to do today will be a little bit of a repeat with added uh, verses onto it. Of course, Myra was able to get through all of hers untouched by any of the um, weather circumstances or internet issues that we had. Uh, but glory be to God, we are here once again to be able to lift up the name of Jesus, to um, be able to exalt his holy name. Uh, with that said, you know, honey, I'm going to just turn this over to you to do what you do and just go into your moment. Okay. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for the knowledge that you are with us, Father, and that all things are good because of that. We bless this day, Father, because we are blessed, and we want to continue to be a blessing to others as you have blessed us. May whatever comes to pass, the words that we share be a blessing and an encouragement for those who listen. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. 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 Well, I was looking for something uplifting to share. So I felt the Lord told me I had like these three devotionals I have not used for ages. And I just read for the day um, what they had to share, and they all were sharing for the same thing. So I wanted up. I started off in Jeremiah, and I wanted up in First Corinthians ten, twelve. So this is what the Lord has shared with my, with me to share today, and I just pray that it will encourage you and challenge you. It says, "Wherefore let him that sinketh he standeth." Take heed lest he fall. Now this is in the chapter, the tenth chapter of First Corinthians. Uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, who we know were basically pagans before um, the Word of God captured their hearts, and he's used this chapter to reiterate the past and how, where we came from as far as our heritage and in Christ. And he goes back to the Old Testament. A lot of people don't uh, think that the Old Testament has value, but it is because it is a valuable book because it gives us examples of how God actually was present in some form. With the Egyptians, it was a form of a cloud and fire, but he was there. He was in the, in the temple. And the people still walked away from him. So he's encouraged them initially from the word. And he says their, the heritage, their heritage is part of what Moses went through in the people of Israel. And they were rescued from Egypt. And during that time, they ate the spiritual meat, which he's probably talking about the manna. Because that, you don't even know what it is. It's just manna. But it came from God. I mean, he fed them so that they didn't have to kill anything, he fed them. And they drank the spiritual drink. And that was the water, I believe it was the water that, that God directed Moses when they were out of water, to hit a rock and just bring it up. It, it was all examples of how God was with them. But he says, which the spiritual drink and the spiritual meat, which was the spiritual rock that followed them and he says that rock was Christ. He was there during this journey that they were going with, that they were going through. But it, it continues to talk about, but with many, God was not pleased, for they were overcome in the wilderness. And they drank and they got up and played, but they played at things that were not godly. Now these things were 
all examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And we're back to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. This is about idolatry, fornication, tempting Christ, and memory. And when I read that tempting Christ, I was like, mm, what does that mean? And I kept thinking about it, because I've read this before, but it, you know, it's just like the word just comes up. And it was, when I went back to Genesis, um, Exodus, I'm sorry, 17, 2, there was an incident where they hit the rock. Well, before they, they wanted water. And they were getting frustrated with Moses, but actually they were, they were not happy with God. And basically they were saying, is he really God? Is he really going to get us through that? And that's what tempting means. It's testing him. It's, it's, it's saying that, you know, I'm going to challenge you. Are you really who you say you are? That's not what we should be doing. God is God, and he is sovereign. And the wonderful thing is, in this, in this chapter, it says one of the most beautiful verses and most encouraging verses that I, I have ever known. And it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. We're all tempted. We're all tempted. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And I used to teach this to some of the kids, and I would say, oh, the way of escape is to say, no, that's the way of escape. And he's encouraging them, do not go the way of the of, your, your forefathers who were in the, in the desert, who had been rescued from Egypt, had seen God provide food and water, and still questioned, tempted God by their actions and by their attitude. I mean, Moses suffered because of what the people were saying to him. But God was displeased because they were displaying their displeasure with God. Are you really God? Are you really going to rescue us? He showed himself in so many ways. But whenever they got into a place that seemed hard to them, they challenged him. That's, you know, he said, I'm following God. But that's that scripture again. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Because they were saying, we're the people of God. But when things got tough, they were like, I don't know. Is he really real? Is he really going to do this for us? It was like they, they had, like I've heard Max say it a lot of times, like he's, a, he's Santa Claus. I want this, I want that. Did they not trust God to provide every need that they had? And this goes on to, to the 21st um, verse. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devil. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of the devils. Because that's, that's a, to me, that's an example of how we as Christians, the Christian community is, is displaying itself. You know, I, I can't um, cast aspersions on people, which I know is, I always use these big words. But look at, look at so-called Christians. Are we out there doing the work of evangelists? Are we out there displaying God's pleasure? Are we out there encouraging people? Are we out there talking about him? Or are we just about listening to whatever kind of music we want to listen to, going to parties and dancing in such rude ways? I've, you know, this TikTok and real thing is displaying a lot of stuff that... <laughs> are really showing where people are. And I, I'm not really into it that much, but lately, because it's all in your face, out of curiosity, I open it up, and I see some people I know. People who are singing on a choir, people who, they will say, I am a Christian, and out there partying and shaking their bodies in ways that really would displease God. Would they do that in front of God? 
doing things that just this would truly displease God. They're tempting God, saying like, well, I can sing on the choir on Sunday, but when I want to get together with my buddies, I'm going to do what I want to. And as far as the music is concerned, I don't know why y'all listen to Beyonce. She's, she's the devil. <laughs> I mean, the things that she displays is so obvious when you have horns and symbols of demonic stuff and satanic things and talking about well using the language she uses in her in her songs and I'm not listening to it. I'm listening to people who are talking about it and they're using they're showing them the language. And like and so many Christians love Beyonce. What does that scripture say? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. I mean, we are in some deep water right now as far as the Christian community. And you know what? It's not hard because it's all around us. That's the temptation. Go back to that. There's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. And the devil is busy. He wants to pull us out. He wants to disgrace God. He can't do it because God is God. He is not going to be, you know, dis distraught about someone talking about him. He's distraught and not pleased with his people. But yet he still loves us. Yet he still has hope in us that we will turn around and be about what we should be about. I love this verse. It says in 23, um, 10, I'm still doing Spanish, 10, <laughs> 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. When I looked that word up, it said attaining our own end, convince that it's proper, but it's improper and it's immoral. Then this is a dictionary. So the dictionary is still old school because I bet you couldn't find that definition and something was written in 2020. They wouldn't define it that way. But they're speaking here that something is immoral, expedient. You want it, but it's truly immoral. It's improper. It says all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not and in that same definition the same different definition is included the words morality and improper so to edify is to bring someone lift someone up morally and then to do something that's opposite of improper to encourage them those are the two things that are not happening as, as much. Morality is out the window in so many areas is crazy. Things improper don't seem to be improper anymore. Where's the moral standard? It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. But we have said, I am a Christian, but I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to live my life because... This is my life. God gave me a choice. I heard something again today. Um, my One of my favorite pastors. I'm going to say he's my favorite pastor. <laughs> Mark. And he was saying, people say, well, God is going to condemn you to, to, to die. He's going to condemn you to, to, to the devil. He's going to condemn you to hell. No, he's not. It says in the Bible, choose life. I give you choices. Choose life. And if you don't choose life, you suffer the consequences. That's your choice. He's not saying, I'm condemning you. It's your choice. Do you want to be with God? Do you want to be with Christ? Do you want to live in the form and fashion the Holy Spirit speaks to us? Oh, we're going to choose death. I mean, there are so many scriptures in Hebrews that says, you know, he, saw, he takes them out to save them from their own. He does everything. He he prepared his son to come and die for us. He has done so much to intervene, to help us to make the right decision. But it's our decision. 
God has rethought and rethought, although he knows what's going to happen, but he repented in the Old Testament because all of us wouldn't, wouldn't have been here if he hadn't repented and given us another chance. And then he you know, sends his son to literally come to die for us. All of that is because he loves us. But we do we love him? Do we spend time with him? Do we get to know him? The power of the Holy Spirit has no power if we don't listen to him. The word of God has no power if we don't spend time reading it or listening to it. We have no excuse because in some countries you can't even get a Bible. You can't even listen to the word of God because it's prohibited. But we have an open society. It's so open that people who are licit and immoral have a ground to stand on. So why do we choose to encourage, sorry, encourage them instead of encouraging the things that will proclaim that God is God and that he has the best for us? We cannot concede to the things of this world. If we do, we're condemning ourselves. Galatians 2.20. Everyone knows this, but do we listen? Do we really take this to heart? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that how we living as Christians? Back to that 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not hurting anybody. You're hurting your relationship with the Lord. You're hurting the, the blessings for your life. Because that's what he desires to do, to bless us, not to curse us, but to bless us. And to receive that blessing, we have to die. Not say, I'm going to die. No, I'm crucified with Christ because he's got to be involved in that, in that death. Well, you can put down smoking, you can put down this, you can put down that. That's you. But if Christ is in you through the Holy Spirit, you need that help to say, by him, I die because of him. I love him so much that I am willing to negate this spirit, this carnal spirit that I have, and take on the spirit of the living God through Christ Jesus and his Holy Spirit that will lead me and guide me into all truth, his truth. The worst thing that I read in when I started this study was Jeremiah 21, 14. And that's what I'm going to end with. Even though it's Old Testament, it's the Word of God. And he's talking to a people who were being invaded and were going to be taken, taken captive and having years and years and years of living under the dominion of the enemy. But they walked that way and this was the consequence. And this is a prophet, Jeremiah 21:14. He spoke to these people and said, But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, saith the Lord. The fruit of your doings. What are we doing? Is there fruit in the things that we do? Ask yourself that. Pray about that. Pick up your Bibles. Turn on the radio. Look for teaching that will not just tickle your ears but look for teaching that will speak the word of God that teaches what God mm -hmm. says it's not about us being rich and, and beautiful and having a new house and a car and all this that is not anywhere in the Bible he wants to provide for us exactly what we need and what we need is a closer walk with the Lord 
and he will provide everything else. And that is not about things. It's about relationship. We will have food, clothing, and something over our heads, most of us. But there are people that won't even have that, will have scraps, will have a, a, a tent over their head, will have the same outfit for days and days and days. But those people will be thankful that they know they are loved by God and they have made a choice to bless him, to praise him, to thank him in whatever circumstance we're in. And we are, we are so blessed that we don't have to suffer that yet. But it's coming. The times are coming that we will have to make a stand. Are we for God? Are we just testing him by our attitudes and our demeanor, even by our words? Be careful that you don't forsake your own life because of the, the temptations mm -hmm. of this world. Where your spirit, the Holy Spirit says, turn that off. Don't listen to that. Walk away from that. Do that. Because we have to stand for him. If not, we're going to fall. It's your life. It's your decision. God's not going to send you to hell. We're sending our own selves to hell by our choices. So let the fruit of our doing be something that blesses God, that pleases him. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. Um, first of all, honey, you're getting a lot of love out here on the Facebook airwaves. Um, so I just want to... Um, acknowledge um, Talita and Linda Matthews, mm -hmm. Susan, always faithful, um, so many others. I, I guess I shouldn't call her everybody's name because <laughs> I'll miss somebody. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that at the core of what you said is that we are dealing with a moral decay uh, and it, it starts in our hearts mm -hmm. and even those that are putting on a front that they are disciples of Christ, as you've shared, and I've seen it myself, um, post things that are so worldly, like, I, you know, I'd almost be shocked, except I've seen so much of it that I'm not even shocked by these things anymore because it's like, going back to the scripture that is one of my favorite scriptures, you know, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. And so what you display publicly is your testimony. And if that doesn't uh, glorify Christ and edify the body, mm -hmm. then you really are not understanding what discipleship is all about. So as always, my love, thank you so much for keeping it real. I was actually texting here with uh, Carolyn Murchison Henry mm. and just saying, my girl is preaching today. Um, I said, is that me or is that Myra? Um, but it is so relevant that we are living in a time where things are just going down the cesspool of just demonic influences. And by the way, because you mentioned Beyonce, and she might actually be mentioned mm. in something I say today, she will definitely be part of at least one lesson that I'm going to share probably in the next couple of weeks. I'm trying to get through Revelation 9, but um, she has always demonstrated uh, these uh, satanic uh, uh, things in her music, in the pictures. L let me give you guys just because this kind of deals with something that I'm dealing with right now, Revelation, just to uh, whet your appetites. There are four images of Beyonce on horses. Uh, I know that one of them is on her current project, Renaissance, 
The second one is on British Vogue. There's a third one, I think, in Bazaar Magazine. I think and there's a fourth one. I can't remember off the top of my head because I wasn't going in this direction. But interesting enough, uh, on one image, she's on a red horse. Mm. On the next image, she's on a black horse. On the next one, she's on a white horse. And lastly, on the pale horse. Mm. This is revelation. And like I've tried to explain to you all that um, the devil simply duplicates or counterfeits that which is holy. And so these things that have been talked about in Revelation, we are actually seeing it duplicated in her presentation. So um, I'm going to deal uh, probably in the next two weeks specifically with her project Renaissance because that is just so, so demonic in so many ways. And I know that other people have talked about it, and I normally don't focus on one particular person, especially a celebrity, but in this case, it is so dangerous. And because I know that I had my friend, uh, Linda Hill Matthews, uh, I don't know whether she's with us right now, but she is definitely a supporter of our ministry, and because she also supports God's plan for music ministry through her ministry, her and her husband, uh, Back to Basics. I think it's apropos that this subject gets deal dealt with because she's the one that opened up my mm. eyes and opened up my ears to not just entertain all kinds of nonsense, even in music, even though it sounds good. There are spirits that are in these things that we listen to. And this is, again, not what I'm talking about today, but that's what I'm working on, and I want to get it right. So watch out for that probably in the next couple of weeks or so. But for today, as I shared when we um, started this, um, last week we had a major storm come through. It wiped out our Internet I tried to revive it and, and bring it back, and that got wiped out again. So you only caught a portion of what I was sharing last week. But I'm going to go ahead and cap this thing off um, for what I planned on doing last week. So I'm in Revelation chapter 9, and last week I kind of covered uh, verses 13 and 14. I'm going to go over them again quickly and then close out um, the portion that I had set up, which is actually going to be verses 15 through 19. And next week, God willing, um, we will cap it off with the last two verses of Revelation. So that would be uh, 2021, I believe. So um, in all of this, we are seeing a picture. Some say it's the pre-tribulation. Some say it is tribulation. Honestly, it doesn't matter. It, we're not going into heavy theology here. What we are going into is that through the Apostle John, we are getting a picture of the end time gospel, and we are seeing it through demonic forces that have literally been unleashed out of the bottomless pit to take their place in the earth with the sole purpose of destroying mankind. And so when we get to verse 13 in Revelation 9, we are now getting a picture of the sixth Angel, And again, I think last week I made note, it's so interesting that the sixth angel specifically is dealing with the uh, moral degradation of mankind because six, of course, is the number of man. And so with this sixth angel, man is being dealt with specifically and we should take heed in what is being said through the prophetic uh, ministry of the Apostle John here. But in verses 13, let me just read it first in Scripture. 
Um, and I'm reading from the Eastern Standard Version, the ESV. It says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And I know that I specified that the area around the Euphrates River is something that you really want to pay attention to because many think that that is also the area where life began right outside the Garden of Eden. And people also say that that's where life as we know it will probably end in that same area territory. This is also, this area around the Euphrates River is also the area that separates Israel from the Assyrian nations. And so it's significant that this is right around the battlegrounds of the end time as we know it. And into this, we are given this image of these four altars and four demonic angels that have been released. And, 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 and I'm, I know I said this last week as well. This is so significant because right now, maybe you, don't, you guys don't know this, but um, God has basically given over the air, the atmosphere that we live in, and allow Satan to do his business right now, right now. And so he is called Satan, that is, Prince of the Air. And so if you want to know why your world is whack right now, it's because God, God, now through his permissive will, God has allowed these things so that things will happen according to the way that God wants them. It's not that God is purposing allowing evil, but God has got to let this thing play out because at the end of the day, what all of these occurrences in our world, both natural and spiritual, what they speak to is dividing the wheat from the tear. And we are finding out right now who is real about the gospel and who are perpetrators and fakes. I mean, think about this, guys. All the stories that we're, we're hearing in the news right now, Creflo Dollar all of a sudden uh, getting a new revelation about tithing. Yet when you hear what he's saying, we actually find out that what he's requiring of his own church and each one of us who listens to him is actually more than the general understanding of what a tithe is which is 10%, and actually, even in Old Testament, it's actually closer to more like 33% if you understand the different layers of tithing. That's a whole nother lesson right there as well. But into this mix, we also have the million-dollar uh, pastor. This is the one who supposedly has gotten robbed at gunpoint, and now he's beefing with uh, a, a comedian, D.L. Hughley. And you wonder, why would a man of God, if he's a man of God, even entertain having a bullying session with anybody of the world when we are supposed to be overcomers of that world? But that's not just it. We're also talking about the travesty of what's taking place in the Southern Baptist realm, where now you have one of the top people in the Southern Baptist Conference actually bringing on women as pastors, which is totally anti-biblical and being defiant about it, basically saying, I have enough power to do whatever I feel like doing. And not only that, but also introducing LGBTQ standards into the church. And these things, I'm bringing them up 
because this is the atmosphere in which we get these four demonic angels who have been released. And what I was trying to, uh, the point I was trying to make is that they were bound and only after uh, this, all of this is taking place in our world are these four demonic angels now being released. And, and it's significant, guys, because if God is allowing all of this demonic activity in the air, yet had these four angels bound, that must mean that these are serious demonic forces that are prevalent in our world, if not today, yet to come. They are coming. And so also significant is that they, they are for them that encompass each part of our world, north, south, east, and west. They encompass all of that. And what's significant is, is that their attack is directly going first to Israel because that is the place where they want to establish the uh, the the temple, the this new temple, this demonic temple, and the Antichrist would be the one who would be leading the charge in that area of the world. And the Bible uh, prophesies that the people will be fooled; they will be bamboozled, and thinking that we are talking about world peace and we're going to finally have love and joy and everything that we've ever wanted. But it's a facade because the devil and his minions are coming in order to put on a false presence in order to destroy the witness of Christ and destroy us in the process. That's the summation of what I was dealing with last week. And so... As we go into verse 15, let me read this for you. It says, So the four angels who have been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. And I wanted to put a pause right there and let you know that our movies, our entertainment mirror what is being said there. Okay, let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay, all you guys that love Marvel movies, I had to count myself in there. Um, all of you all that, you know, know about in game and know about Thanos. If you recall, what was Thanos' purpose? His purpose was to eliminate half of the population with the uh, intent to supposedly create world peace and to be able to have enough provision in the earth to take care of those who remain. Ah, but that is not what the real intent is. And Revelation 9 really focuses on the fact that what the real intent is, is for demonic destruction of people. The good news is that those who have found themselves to be the chosen of God won't have to endure the literal slaughter that's going to take place. And I know that we've looked at movies such as Left Behind and all of these apocalyptic movies. I'm telling you guys, that is fantasy land according to the Bible. You won't even know what hit you until it is already taking place. That is why Myra and I come out here on Facebook Live and on YouTube in order to 
put out the warning cry, being like the voice crying out in the wilderness, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. We need to understand that we cannot uh, uh, pacify ourselves with these feel-good messages coming from feel-good pulpits, from feel-good churches that make us dance and shout and have the Holy Ghost, as we call it, and not hear the real message. This is a time, beloveds, of preparation. This is a time to make the Word of God relevant to as many people as possible. The end is near. And I know that we've heard that proclamation for year after year. All I want you to, to think about is what is near to God? That could be a thousand years. That could be just one day to God. So even though it has not happened yet, we should be wary of everything that is going on in our world. In previous weeks, I talked about this attack that is coming from the north. Who's in the north? Russia's in the north. China's in the north. What is Russia doing? Russia, can you believe this, guys? Even as we're sitting here, do you not know that Russia and China on several occasions have come together Originally two enemies, now frenemies, and what are they doing? They are having war games. They are practicing. So, and, and then on top of that, we talk about the, uh, the election, the, the one that brought in Biden, and we talk about how the voting system has been manipulated. Well, who is the main culprit? Comes out of Russia. These things are from the north. How does China play into this? China. Who owns the United States right now? China does. And we are sitting around wondering why we are dealing with major inflation, why the gas prices are so high. It is an attack on the way of life for those who believe in republics and those who re uh, believe in democracy. You're going to see, even in our government right now, that we have people that are in the Senate and in the House that are known Marxists and known communists. And we sit around and wonder why everything is falling apart. Why we keep having to have debates about abortion when we know Morally, that abortion is murder. Why we keep having debates about who is a woman? What is a woman? Why are we debating these things when even a baby understands what a woman is? And yet, we have doctrine out here that is now trying to change pronouns from he and she to they and them. And you wonder how God could be pleased with us. I got really excited there <laughs> because this is serious business and we have to stop playing around with the word of God. We have to stop trying to pacify our, ourselves. You know, our, our songs today, they're talking about, you know, fix it, Jesus, fix it like you said you would. We keep going through that nonsense when we should be in Humble adoration in worship. Jesus, Myra was talking about it earlier. Jesus is not the slot machine that you pull when you need to get your bill paid. That's not how it works. If your bill never gets paid, you're supposed to show allegiance to the Most High God. We have signed on as Christians to take on our own crosses to deny ourselves and to follow him. There's nothing convenient about being a Christian. So I know that we like to have these feel-good messages, 
Oh, Lord, I know you love me. Oh, Lord. But let me tell you, that is good. And God does love you. But to be a disciple of the Most High God means that we have to be willing to take on the starts and the arrows that are slung by the enemy, naturally and spiritually. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in high places. This is what's going on in Revelation 9. As now these angels of death have been unleashed and a half, oh, excuse me, in this case, a third of uh, the world population will be eliminated. And if you add other end time scriptures into other places where there is life lost, it actually works out to a half. Just like Marvel. And what did I tell you guys? I know I've said it a million times. You want to know what's going on in the world? Look at your movies. You want to know what's going on? Listen to your music. Because Satan is speaking to us through these mediums. And those things that we think are fantasy become reality. And we're watching it. And we are allowing ourselves and our children to fall into the pit of hell and what Myra said earlier talking about you know you cut on uh, Facebook and cut on the reels and look she was nice about it it is straight pornography when you cut those things on and you even have babies in the presence of of drag queens and in the presence of their mothers and other women in their lives twerking and having men humping on these women and you say that this is supposed to be moral and then you say that I'm a church girl or I'm a church dude and yet that's your entertainment and you party just like them when you are not in the house of worship. And you wonder why everything is falling apart in our world, in our lives. You wonder why there's a rebellion with our children and why there's a rebellion where women are being lifted up and men are being diminished, where women are diminishing themselves because they have allowed themselves to be pimped and they have allowed themselves to be whored because this world now says that your quality is in your booty and not in your brain. And you wonder why there is so much hell breaking loose right now. Why our children are literally being taught to hate you as parents and they're being taught to have alternative lifestyles that promote transgender. And you wonder what in the world is going on. Well, it's all right here in Revelation 9. Let me continue. My God, my God. Woo! Look, God had prepared for the release of these demonic angels at a precise time. Here it says, in the hour, the day, the month, the year. So this is God. God orchestrates everything. So if it's happening, God has allowed it for holy purposes. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing it here. Their purpose was to kill off a third of the population. You want to read about that? Go to Daniel 12, 1. Earlier in Revelation 6, uh, verses 7 through 8, the fourth seal judgment released the pale horse or the pale horseman who caused the death of one-fourth of the earth's people. We're doing the math now, okay? When you do the math overall in this very short period of time, during the tribulation period, over half of the population was killed. 
That's important, guys. That is what Marvel was doing when Thanos, supposedly being an angel of, of you know, intellect, of caring, was actually being a demonic force to destroy the earth through wiping out a half of its population. You're seeing entertainment reflect what's going to happen in this apocalyptic period. And we sit down with popcorn and sodas and call it a good time. We're literally seeing this stuff right before our eyes and you wonder why it is that you feel that God has somehow forsaken you. Myra said it earlier, you know, through um, our friend Pastor Mark. Uh-uh. God doesn't forsake anything. If you miss the mark with God, it's because you have forsaken God. God, God you know, God is God and he has holy purposes that he doesn't actually need for you or me or Myra to understand. He gives us his word. He gives us his plan. He gives us the Bible to lay out the plan. And when we deny that plan, we have done it of our own power because we listen to the wrong daddy. Not Daddy Jehovah, not Daddy Yahweh, but we listen to Satan, the father of lies. Mm. Let me read verse 16. Let me just read the, the complete thing throughout. S starting 16, going to 19. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. If y'all don't know the man, that's 200 million troops. We don't know whether they're natural. We don't know whether they are supernatural. What we do know, interesting enough, to the north, there's population in China and in India that could actually field troops of 200 million and only basically cut out uh, a fifth of their populations. So... I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be here trying to be a theologian as much as just trying to give you guys a picture. Again, whether these troops are natural or supernatural, <laughs> does it really matter? God has said, this is what's to come. And so, John says himself, as I continue in Revelation 9, I heard their number. So this is an exact number that that John heard from God himself. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths by these three plagues again the three plagues fire smoke sulfur by these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads. And by means of them they wound. Woo! This is serious business, y'all. Look, verses 16 through 19, John is told a number for a demonic army of 200 million. The leader of this invasion is referenced 
in Ezekiel 38. I've talked about that before. Using the phrase or terminology of Gog, G-O-G, and Magog, M-A-G-O-G. My understanding of that is that Gog is a representation of the Antichrist and Magog is the territory in which this Antichrist figure will inhabit. However you interpret that, know that it's serious business. All of Ezekiel 38 is giving a description of this demonic presence that we have to be wary of because he is showing himself. We see it now in our world. We'll see it even more as this world continues. Anyway, in Ezekiel 38 uses that terminology of Gog and Magog and describing this army being led by the chief priest who is Meshach and his nation is established in the northeast region of Asia Minor. This is an army of horses and horsemen with swords and shields with the intent to invade and to wreak havoc first over Israel. The colors, listen to this, red. Sapphire blue and yellow. I thought, you know what? This is real interesting. Now, Myra should know where I'm going with this, but <clears throat> red, red like fire, blue like sapphire, and yellow like sulfur. Well, did y'all know that those three colors, remember again, Revelation is about threes. They're threes all throughout Revelation. But in this case, this unholy three actually makes up the primary colors that we use every day. Any artist would know that every other color in the spectrum is made out of red, yellow, and blue. And so, interesting enough, again, what God has used to create the color scheme of the earth, Satan comes and perpetrates it to use it for demonic purposes. So, you know, we, we equate that to the rainbow and how the rainbow signified the fact that God would no longer destroy the earth by water. And it was his sign that new beginnings would take place. And of course, what does Satan do? He now uses it to be the color wheel spectrum of the LGBTQ. And let me add some more. I-A, let me add another letter, P. And more letters to come. As another B, I'm, I'm, I'm giving y'all this for free. P represents pedophilia, which is right there. And we know this because of drag queens that are allowed to now be in schools to, to, to work with children. Can you believe that? But this other B is one that's to come, and that is bestiality. Those same reels that you see on Facebook, they show horses being used in sexual ways, animals being sexualized. This stuff is right on the horizon, and we just look at it and laugh because we think it's entertainment. It is a sign of the times. Anyway, the red of fire, the blue of sapphire, and the yellow of sulfur. There is no good thing that comes from any of these things. They are all being used here as instruments of destruction. The army had heads like ones of a lion. We dealt with that earlier in Revelation 9, and we see it again, okay? Similar to those demonic locusts earlier in the chapter. The fire, the smoke, 
and so forth, all have properties to destroy and kill. And we should see these occurrences as an opportunity to share the importance of being a follower of Christ. So look, as I'm wrapping this thing up for today, next week, we'll deal with the last two uh, verses of Revelation uh, 9, because in those two uh, last verses, 20 and 21, whew, it's some powerful stuff, even though it's only two verses. But let me cap this thing off right here. We know that our enemy has come but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Earlier in Re uh, Revelation 9, we were teased by these spiritual locusts. And what did they have as tails? They had the end being like the scorpion. What did we talk about the scorpion? The purpose of the tail is, again, to put out its venom. And even though only a small portion of actual natural scorpions have venom to kill, interesting enough, when we look at and think about demonic angels, they make up a third, here's a three, a third of those angels that were cast out of heaven. And it's the same third, I believe, that had this venom that can wipe out nations. And we see it manifest itself in these demonic angels that are bringing about this 200 million troops. And they are coming with fire and with sapphire and with sulfur. You know, sulfur will actually take the breath out of you if you're exposed in that environment with no air. Smoke. Did y'all know it's actually smoke that will kill you? The fire destroys you, but it's the smoke inhalation that actually kills you if you're in a fire. So we are, again, seeing the Bible manifest what is going to take place. And we have to take these things seriously, beloveds. I'm wrapping it up. This is serious business. What Myra and I do is serious ministry. We're not playing around and we're not trying to perpetrate that we have all the answers either. We sin and fall short of the glory of God, just like each one of you. And, you know, on a daily basis, we too have to die to the sin that we basked in the previous day. And thank God his mercies are new. His faithfulness is always present. And we have to figure out how to be better in our Christian walk, how to be better in our Christian talk, how to be the trumpets of God in this earth, to put out a cry to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. That is the only goal that we have here on Adoration Sunday service is to be truthful to the word of God. And if we should somehow find that we share something amiss, then we will humbly apologize and to ask forgiveness of you as we seek repentance or to, to have repentance before God, that we would catch the errors of our ways. But we take this 
very seriously. And it had to be serious because God would not have recorded this through the Apostle John if it did not have significance for us today. Beloveds, we love you. I get excited. I get passionate about this stuff. I know Myra is looking to, to the Lord every week to make sure that I don't make some kind of body move to just wipe her right <laughs> off the, the camera. But even in that, the Holy Spirit is an intelligent spirit and knows when I need to reel that passion in. But I care so much about the Word of God. I care. Myra said it earlier. I'll say it again. We see so many of our friends who have professed Christ and they show up in atmospheres that are unholy. They entertain thoughts that are unholy. They say one thing in houses of worship, but they do other things. Dear person in our world, on praise teams that we have been blessed by, is showing people twerking and hitting and bonging. And, and I'm going, what the what? But you say that you are a disciple of Christ. It breaks our hearts because for this world out here, we may be the only Christ that they see. And when they see that we have no more moral standards than they have, why would they choose Christ when we are not living as if we've chosen him? Joshua said it, choose ye this day who you will serve. Um, we just want to just tell you again, we love you. Be encouraged. I'm not saying these things to throw fear at you. I'm saying these things because we still have time. We don't know how much time we have left. And so if you need to get things right, let me just give you the steps right here. Y'all just going over to Ephesians, uh, what is that, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I, I, my wife is so good. She's finding it for I me right now. Ephesians. <laughs> that's, you said it. that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We're in sync. She's so good. Because I want you to read that, darling, because this, unlike what, what happens in most church services where they have you go Romans 10, 9, all right, Nothing wrong with Romans 10, 9 in its place based upon what was happening to those that Paul was writing about. But this is the prerequisite for salvation as the Bible truly says that. You got it, my love? Ephesians 8 and 9, right? 2. 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Bottom line, it's nothing that we do other than to demonstrate faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We know that, I think it's... Uh, Hebrews uh, eleven six, I think that's it. Right. Yeah, that without uh, faith, it's impossible to please Him. Okay, it, so faith is the only measure that we bring to this party. Everything else is a gift of God. Mm -hmm. Now, what we also stress for those of you all that have that faith and are truly saved. We know that we have a responsibility that we don't sit on salvation as our little private gift in which we don't have any responsibilities 
uh, in order to demonstrate that salvation because um, in Acts chapter 2, I believe in uh, 38, you know, we are given something else to consider upon that salvation. And I'm going to have her uh, get to that as well. You know, because what was going on, we know that in Acts chapter 2 was the um, um, introduction of the Holy Spirit uh, as we know it in the upper room. And we know that after all these things went on in the upper room, that they started to ask, oh my gosh, what do we do? And have we gotten there? I'm too. All right, 238. It says... Actually, go 37 first. Okay. Now, when they heard this, what did they hear? <laughs> now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Good enough. Good enough. And with that repentance and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, it will be impossible for you as a Christian to just sit around and watch this nonsense take place and not share the true word with people who need to hear it. We love you. God bless you. And we will see you next week.